Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. As my special guest on Looking at the Markets today, I have Mr. Troy Bombardia from uh, bullmarkets.co. Uh, and he is an analyst, commentator, and a market expert. And I'm going to let him talk about himself in a moment. But uh, I saw an article about the 200-day moving average written by Troy, and it really fascinated me. And I said to myself, I've got to get in touch with this guy and get him on my channel uh, because he is an expert at the markets, and I want you to listen to this whole interview. It's going to be fascinating. Mr. Bombardia, thank you, and welcome to Looking at the Markets, sir. Thanks for having me on, David. Yeah, so I worked for around 9 to 10 years in my family's hedge fund. We mostly traded gold and silver and then some U.S. equities on the side. And that went very well for nine years. We 40 x our capital, which is quite insane. But it was mostly just like a family, friends only hedge fund. And then through over the last two to three years, I've been really into trading U.S. stocks. Um, but more so, when we traded gold and silver, we did it more so using a technical approach. For example, you know, moving averages, uh, RSI, contrarian indicators, pulling your bands, that sort of thing. Whereas when now I trade on uh, U.S. stocks, I do so by combining fundamental analysis with technical analysis, but always doing that through a quantified approach, not just looking at a chart and say, hey, the market's going up right now, I think I should be long, or the market's going down right now, I think I should be short. So when you quantify something, you always know exactly how bullish or bearish it is, rather than just kind of guessing, I think it's bullish or I think it's bearish. So yeah, basically, I worked with my family for nine years, and now just running my own investment research firm and trading on my own. I think it was called Fundamental Capital. Did I get the name right? That's right. That's the name of the investment research firm. Great. Okay, so bullmarkets.co and Fundamental Capital. So I wanted to get right into the nitty gritty of it. The 200-day moving average. Man, a lot of people depend on this indicator for their trading and investing decisions. But I read an article by you, and I'll put that article in the link, uh, a link to it in the description below this video. I want people to check it out as soon as they're done watching this video. Uh, you gave the opinion, backed up by 30 years of research, that mm. maybe the 200-day moving average by itself isn't so useful as a buy and sell indicator. Can you explain that, and can you defend yourself on that one? Yeah, right. So actually recently, um, I we expanded the study all the way back to 1950. So more data, more, uh, it's more accurate, right? And what you find, and it's basically, it's a very simple Excel formula. Basically just buy if the S&P is above its 200-day moving average, and then sell and shift into cash if the S&P is below or equal to its 200-day moving average. And when you create that equation and it calculates it all down, what you end up seeing is that that strategy actually does no better than buy and hold. In fact, it doesn't matter, what, and we tested basically 200 different moving averages, the 200, 199, all the way down to the two-day moving average. And what you find is very interesting is that from the five-day moving average all the way to 200-day, even if you were to go, for example, to the 252-day, which is the one-year moving average, because there's 252 days in a trading days in a calendar year, what you find out is that not, no, there is no single moving average that beats buy and hold. And if you were to plot it out on a curve, what it looks like is if you were to, for example, use a 20-day moving average, your underperformance is worse. But as you increase the time of that moving average, for example, you go to the 200, the 150, or the 250, your performance gets closer and closer to buy and hold. So, for example, if buy and hold is, let's say, 7.6% a year, using, for example, the 200-day moving average might give you 7 or 7.2. And if you were to use, for example, the 252-day moving average, you might get to 7.3, 7.4%. So they get incrementally closer to buy and hold, but none of them actually beats buy and hold. And that's very interesting because that's not what um, conventional trading wisdom tells you, right? And this is just talking about for the S&P itself. You have to test it out on different markets for you doing gold. You have to test that idea out on gold. And we did that as well. It beat buy and hold, but by a little bit. But just speaking for the US stock market for the S&P itself, it doesn't beat buy and hold. And if you were to think about the data, it inherently makes sense because 
What the 200-day moving average does really well is it helps you avoid a lot of volatility because all the massive volatility, by definition, is going to occur under the 200-day moving average, right? Like you look at all the big bear markets, for example, 2008, even the 1987 crash, uh, 2001 to 2002, 1973 to 1974, right? By definition, all of those massive swings and the big crashes, they have to occur under the 200-day moving average because the instant it starts to crash, it's going to fall under the 200-day, right? So what the 200-day does is it helps you avoid volatility. It decreases the volatility in your portfolio, but it doesn't on its own help you outperform. And there's a very simple reason for that. So imagine this, when the market declines, for example, big bear market like 2008, right? Yes, using that as a buy sell signal, buy when it's above the 200 and then sell when it just falls below the 200, that helps you avoid that massive 2008 or even the 1987 decline, right? But what ends up happening is that it doesn't help you pick the bottom. So it doesn't let you, for example, the March 2009 bottom, right? It doesn't make you buy there. It makes you buy somewhere, for example, in June 2009 after the market has gone all the way halfway up. So while you do avoid on a big chunk of the decline, you also do miss out on part of the rally. So that's one part that, that helps you, that doesn't you know, help you too much, right? But the next part and the key point to why using the 200 DMA doesn't help you outperform is because in a bear market, sorry, in a bear market, using that helps you avoid a lot of the declines but in a bull market, it actually helps you, it makes you underperform by a lot, right? Because inherently they say a breakdown below the 200 DMA is bearish, but in a bull market, for example, 2009 to present, 2003 to 2007, 1990 to 2000, right? What ends up happening is that a lot of the breakdowns are false. They break down below the 200 DMA and then it goes right back up, right? And you end up buying it at a higher price because at that point, the 200 DMA is still slowly going up and so you sell when it goes down and then when it breaks back up, the 200 DMA is already higher. So you're buying back at an even higher price. So that's one factor you have to consider, right? And the second factor is also you tend to get a lot of chops. So what happens if it's not a very, very clean breakdown? For example, imagine in a bull market, right? The market breaks down below the 200 DMA and then just kind of chops back and forth, back and forth above and below the 200 DMA like you're seeing recently, right? Yeah. And what's up happening is that you, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts, which is very standard for any trend following model, right? So it breaks down, you sell, it goes back up, you buy at a higher price, <laughs> it breaks down, you sell, it goes back up, you buy at a higher price, right? So that kills you, in a way. So basically, what you, and it doesn't matter, for example, you can apply rules, say, you have to wait two days for the breakdown before you, know, you sell, right? Or you have to wait three days for the breakdown before you sell, instead of just selling the instant it falls below the 200 DMA, right? Or you can apply a rule, for example, only sell if there is, for example, it falls 3% below the 200 DMA. It's a confirmed breakdown, right? We've tested various one of those rules out, and all the rules, and I'm telling you, it's exactly the same thing. It's not much different from just selling the day that it falls below the 200 DMA. So basically, the false breakdowns in a bull market, and because bull markets last much longer than bear markets, right? That's just how the U.S. stock market works. Right. The amount that you lose out on during a bull market is equal to the amount that you gain from you know skipping on the big decline during a bear market. Right. But with that being said, we did discover you know there is one trading strategy that actually beats ninety five percent of traders, and it's ridiculously simple. So here it is. So it's going back to the idea that while the two hundred day moving average on its own it cannot be buy and hold by definition, right? If you just look at the numbers, that's what it tells you. But, like we said, what it does, it helps you skip out of volatility. So that's where the leverage ETF component comes in. Because, as Jordan Soros would say, when you're right, you want to really go for the home run. And, you know, when it's dangerous, you kind of just want to step back and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, right? So, what it is, is if the market is above its 200-day moving average, buy and hold, for example, a 2x leverage ETF for the S&P, like SSO. Right, and if the market falls below its 200-day moving average, then just sell and shift right into cash. Right, and what that does is from 1950 to present, it gives you an average annual return of around 14.2%. And of course, the drawdowns aren't massive because you cannot buy and hold a leveraged ETF forever. Right, if you do that during a bear market like 2008, you're gonna end up losing 95% of your money. Right. But what that does is when the market's going up, because when it's above its 200-day moving average, it's generally an uptrend, right? And when it's below, sometimes you can get that massive crash like 2008. So what that does is when the market's going up, when it's trending nicely, you make massive gains. For example, in a year like 2017, 
SSO would have went up by 60%, right? And a year like this year, while the S&P has been flat, SSO using that strategy would have made a little bit of money, but no big loss. And of course, if the market crashes, then you just, you know, on the sidelines waiting for it to bottom. That's it. It's, it's very interesting. Like, you can do the back testing for yourself. It's very simple. I'll send you the Excel file. It's very simple, 14.2%. And it's ridiculously simple. That's the thing. <laughs> wow. Well, that's that's uh, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Troy Bombardia, you just gave my viewers and listeners an actionable strategy. And this is for long term. This is not for day traders uh, or no. even swing traders, really. But for people who are just buying and holding, you can actually beat the buy and hold S&P 500 strategy quite handily exactly. by using that 200 day moving average the right way with let's say a double leveraged uh, S&P 500 ETF. I know that SSO is that's the ticker for one ETF that serves that purpose. And then people might be thinking, well, it goes up twice as fast. It also goes down twice as fast. But if you get out when the trend is down and the, the candlesticks are hitting that 200 day moving average, you're out and so you might have small losses but it's not too bad wow that's that's fantastic thank you for that do you recommend an ema exponential moving average or the good old sma simple moving average for this type of strategy um the sma is pretty good for that because the thing is if you do the math it's pretty much something like the 200 sma is going to be similar to using something like the 170 ema right So, sorry, some, the other way around, something like the 200 EMA is going to be similar to something like the 170 uh, SMA. Because okay. the SMA, being that it's a simple moving average, it moves more slowly, right? Whereas any EMA is going to stick more closely to the market itself. So it's, it's, don't worry too much about that. Um, it's, they're they're going to end up being very similar. Gotcha. I found the same thing. Over the long term, the SMA and the EMA are very they're, similar. You can almost superimpose them on a chart. Yeah. Whereas for day traders, they may prefer the EMA because they want that recent price action to be more important or weighted more heavily. Absolutely. I recommend people visit Bull Markets with an S, uh, .co. I'm going to put that link in the description below this video so people can get more uh, articles, more access. On your website, bullmarkets.co, what do people see besides the, uh, the blog and the articles and all that good stuff? Um, so basically, the blog and the articles. What we're doing is we're quantifying technical analysis, for example, um, and also quantifying fundamental analysis. For example, let's say our side for the market right now is very oversold. Right? Is this actually bullish or bearish? Right? Historically, when the market hits this kind of low RSI, does it tend to bounce, go up one week later, two weeks later, one month, three months, six months, one year? Right? So we're quantifying technical analysis rather than just looking at it from a chart. And once again, it's very simple. All I just got to do is throw the numbers into Excel. Right? So besides that, we also have a membership program which helps people develop trading models based on combining fundamental analysis with um, technical analysis. But for you know, new visitors, I recommend just checking out the free stuff. There's no need to uh, sign up. But why not sign up? If you like the free stuff, check it out and then get the premium features on bullmarkets.co. Very cool. And check out Fundamental Capital uh, if, you know, if you want more information on that. Fantastic. Yeah, so I wanted to go more into what you're seeing in the markets right now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of volatility. We're seeing greater than 1% moves on a daily basis in the major U.S. indexes. This is not normal. Uh, the normal state of affairs is smaller moves, a gradual grind upward with occasional corrections. But uh, you know these massive moves, are they the sign of a market top? Should people be lightening up on their equities exposure right now? What do you think? Um, well, I definitely think so. And actually, we have the data to back this up. So basically, we build models to determine the long-term direction of the stock market. Is it a bull market or is it a bear market, right? And in a bull market, you had various requirements that need to be ticked off because People commonly think that, for example, a bull market dies of old age, and that's actually factually incorrect. If you were to look at the data of the U.S. from, nine, from say, 1850 to present, what you end up seeing is two things. Economic expansions have lasted longer and longer in terms of time, and bull markets have also lasted longer and longer in terms of time. Because a bull, in the long term, the stock market and the economy move in the same direction, although obviously they don't move at the same magnitude. For example, the economy improves at 1%, the stock market might go up by 5 6 7%, right? That's why, by definition, 
valuations in a bull market are going to increase and valuations in a bear market are going to decrease, right? Because the stock market always amplifies. The stock market is basic human psychology and human psychology and the stock market amplifies the reality of what you're seeing in the economy, right? So basically, in a bull market, it doesn't die of old age, it dies of excess. It dies of basically the economy getting as good as it gets, right? And what you're seeing now, for example, looking at the U.S. unemployment rates, looking at initial claims, or even, you know, housing to an extent, what you're seeing is that we're close to as good as it gets. Like, unemployment rate is historically low, initial claims are also historically low from the, from the 1960s to present, right? So what that's saying is that you're getting close to the end of the bull market. But you cannot use fundamentals to time the bottom or the top. That's where you have to add technical analysis, right? So what you end up seeing is that in the final year of a bull market, you always tend to get this crazy kind of volatility. For example, look at the charts from February all the way to August 2007, right? The exact bull market top was in October 2007, but prior to that, for the eight months prior, you had these crazy up and down swings, up and down swings, right? And also, for example, the bull market topped in March 2000, right? From 1999, especially from May 1999 all the way to March 2000, you had these crazy up and down swings, 10% corrections all the time. Days in the market would go down up 2%, down 2%, exactly what we're seeing right now, right? And that is a sign that you're in the final year of a bull market. And just think about the logic behind it, right? In a normal bull market, you know, people are nice and happy. They're stable, right? They're improving slowly and stably. It's a, it's a very stable environment. Hence, the market goes up slowly. It doesn't go down too fast, right? But towards the end, people start to see signs in the economy. Problems of deterioration in the fundamentals. And some people are starting to get out, right? And when they get out, people always get out faster than they get in. So, hence, you get these massive, very quick drawdowns, right? And then you also get... But because... People have been conditioned for so many years, for say nine and ten years, to believe that you know all you just gotta do is buy and hold, buy and hold every buy every single dip, right? So when the market does go down very quickly, these buy the dip people bring it back up very quickly as well. Hence, you have this very ba a big battle between the bulls and the bears going on, right? But what you end up seeing is that volatility gets. That's why, for example, you look at VIX. VIX is the volatility index, right? VIX always bottoms before the bull market tops. For example, VIX bottomed in February 2007, and then it kind of trended upwards, even though the stock market peaked in October 2007, right? Look, VIX bottomed in the mid-1990s, five years before the bull market peaked in March 2000, right? And so basically, that's just what it is. You tend to get vol crazy amounts of volatility before, in the, for example, nine months to one year before the bull market tops. And so that's how we knew in January 2018 that was in the bull market top because the rally last year from 2017 all the way to January 2018 it was a very steady and non-stop rally. So bull markets don't die on extreme strength. Bull markets die after they've already been weakened. And just to use a simple analogy, imagine a very healthy person, right? A very healthy person is very unlikely to su succumb to illness, right? He, his immune system has to be weakened first in order for him to succumb to a certain illness, right? A very healthy person, you hit him once, he's going to be able to recover. But for someone who's already been weakened, if you hit him once, he might not recover from that, right? So basically, from all from January, December, November of last year to January this year, it was a very steady rally, hence that was on the top, you had a correction, and then it makes a new high, right? And that's why also we think Although, yes, right now, we're certainly in the late stage of this bull market. We don't think September 2018 of this year was the bull market's top. Because once again, from May all the way to September, you had a very, very steady rally. Like the, all the dips were tiny, 1%, 2%, and then they just went right back up, right? And that is not characteristic of the final nine months to one year of a bull market. What's characteristic is what you're seeing right now, lots of crazy volatility. So what we think is probably going to happen is that the stock market is going to go up, it's going to make new highs, but it's going to continue this kind of crazy volatility over the next, for example, six to nine months before it peaks somewhere in mid-2019. But the other point I also want to mention, and this is very, very important, is that people tend to turn bearish too early, which has pretty much been the case for Wall Street during the entire course of this uh, bull market. And the point that yeah, you really have to consider is that Everyone's so afraid, oh, the bear market's coming, the bear market's coming, right? But on the contrary, bear markets 
it, like you're not going to get 2008 in one day. During the first half year of the bear market, it's going to be a very slow decline in terms of, it's not going to go like straight down in one straight line. It's going to go down, like you're seeing right now, 10%, and then it goes up 50, like 50%, it retraces 50% of that decline, and then it goes down, and then retraces 50%. So that tends to happen for like half a year before you really get the, you know, mega crash. So everyone's afraid of the mega crash, but the thing is, during the first half year, it's a very choppy movement. You don't have to, you know, like, you're not going to get caught by the huge mega crash unaware. Right. So, for example, what's very common in the first half year of the bull market is the bull market tops, it goes down, and then it makes at least a 50 to 61.8% fib retracement before it goes down. So if you're caught, you know, don't sell into the crash. You're probably going to cut at the bottom. Wait for the bounce and then get out there. Mm, okay. There will be some dead cat bounces, as they say. Or uh, right. you can call them uh, lower highs and lower lows, but yeah. still a staircase downward, not just a steep descent. Got exactly. it. And it, that's right. If we look at 2007, 2008, 2009, we can see that. And we can see the crazy volatility that uh, it looks like one of those heart monitors going crazy before it goes down. Yeah, and so that is something to look for. Fantastic. I uh, just wanted to ask about technical indicators. Uh, you, we mentioned moving averages, and I think you touched upon RSI briefly. Uh, are there any technical indicators that you use and that you've found to be particularly effective, uh, or are they all just, uh, is it all just a guessing game? Um, well, I like the 200 day moving average for one, not because it helps be buy and hold, but it helps you cut out on the volatility. That's very important, right? Cutting down on your uh, drawdowns. But besides that, I look at, for example, RSI. I'd also look at Bollinger Bands. But I don't look at Bollinger Bands in the sense that is it above the upper band or is it below the upper lower band because as you very well know if it's below the lower band it can keep you know remain below the bollinger band for uh, quite a while right and if it's above it can remain above for quite a while especially in a very steady rally like the year 2017 right well instead what we like to do is look for expansions in the band as a mean reversion game right for example if so basically looking at volatility right when volatility expands like crazy you want to be short volatility right and if volatility is very narrow you want to be long volatility right so basically looking for the percentage change in the Bollinger Bands, which is basically looking for the percentage change in the standard deviation of the market from, for example, today to one month ago to two months ago, right? So we look at that, moving averages our side, because our side is just one of the most popular contrarian indicators, right? Sure. But in our opinion, from what we've seen, our side isn't that useful. For example, it's very hard to know if there's going to be a bullish divergence or if there's not going to be a bullish divergence before the market bottoms, right? Mm. And yes, like in hindsight, you can be like, oh yeah, it caught the bottom perfectly, but how do you know it wasn't like all these other cases where it didn't catch the bottom, right? And there's also a very big range. Like sometimes, you know, the mark's going to bottom when RSI is 30, sometimes when it's 20, and even sometimes when it's 15. So right. That's true. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned about trading volatility, perhaps going uh, short volatility when the Bollinger Bands uh, expand more than normal. Uh, because mm -hmm. when yeah. the Bollinger Bands expand on, let's say, the S&P 500, uh, that means there's a lot of volatility. And volatility mm -hmm. does tend to, you know, the market calms down, investors calm down. Uh, that's something I've learned from Seth Golden, uh, one of my mentors uh, in the volatility space, is that uh, volatility cannot continue to exist indefinitely. The People cannot exist in a state of fear continuously for very long. Even in right. 2008, 2009, uh, the VIX reached 80, but didn't stay there for very long. So even during the worst part of the, that horrendous recession, volatility did collapse rather soon. Uh, so would you make those types of plays? Would you dare to short UVXY, VXX, TVIX, that kind of thing? We wouldn't um, play VIX outright because, and we did that once, and it burned us very badly. <laughs> okay. So the thing about VIX, you got to know, is that you can actually kind of replicate VIX on its own. Hmm. So all you got to do, for example, is apply a 30-day standard deviation to VIX, right? Or better yet, instead of using a 30-day standard deviation, try using, for example, a five-weekly or a 10-weekly standard deviation of the S&P itself, and that gives you a lot more data past 1990, and it actually tracks. VIX itself rather closely, 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here's the key point that a lot of people make. Uh, the key mistake that a lot of people make is they assume that a low VIX is bullish for VIX, so it's bullish for volatility, and that a high VIX is bearish for volatility, right? And that is inherently not true because, as you probably know, VIX can remain low for a very, very long time. Yeah. Like imagine 2017, right? VIX just stays at like 10, 9, 11 for just an entire year, right? If you thought it was going to spike, you would not have made money that year, right? Right. And the same thing at the tops. Sometimes, you know, VIX can top at 20. Sometimes VIX can top at 30, 40, 50. Like it's a massive range, right? So what we used to do is we used to apply an RSI to VIX. And that essentially turns VIX into a relative number instead of an absolute number, right? So if, for example, if you were to, and you can't go long VIX that way. For example, you can't say, like, let's buy uh, VIX if, you know, um, it's RSI falls to 30 or 40 because it can stay that way for a very, very long time, right? But you can use that to short VIX. For example, we, what we used to do is basically you would be bearish on VIX if its RSI exceeded 80, and you would certainly be bearish on VIX if its RSI exceeded 90, right? But recently what we found, out, and this is actually really, really good, is that we did, so going back to the idea, you want to turn VIX, you want to look at the volatility of VIX itself, not just the absolute value of VIX, right? Mm-hmm. And what does the volatility of VIX itself mean? It means the volatility of the volatility of the stock market. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of like a second derivative, right? Yep. So imagine applying a standard deviation on top of a standard deviation of the S&P itself. And what you end up finding is that that actually predicts a lot of these like 6 to 10% corrections very, very accurately. And unfortunately, we made this too late. <laughs> we developed this recently over the past two weeks after the stock market already tanked. It's like, damn it. <laughs> But, but you'll, you know, catch you should, it, you'll catch it the next time, though. So yeah. you're using the VVIX, the volatility of volatility, to... Uh, VVIX, not using any index. We're calculating okay. its own straight on the S&P. So, for example, if you were to calculate a 50-day standard deviation of the S&P itself, right, and then you calculate a 25-day standard deviation of the 50-day standard deviation, and what you end up finding is that it predicts a lot of these bottoms in volatility very accurately. For example, you get that signal in September 2018, right? Right before, you know, volatility spiked and the stock market tank, right? Yep. And you, but one of the, sometimes you get it very early. For example, you get it in October 2017. But the key point is even though you got that, you know, uh, long volatility signal, short S&P signal in October 2017, by the time the stock market does come down, it actually at least goes down to the price where it turned bearish initially, right? Like January, February 2018, it fell at least to the October 2017 level. So at worst, it's no worse than, you know, buy hold. At best, you avoid, for example, a big decline like right now. Interesting. So many methods here. And uh, I may not be able to calculate the standard deviation of a standard deviation myself, okay? I may not have that kind of math ability. But if people go to bullmarkets.co, they can avail themselves of those resources and they can learn more about it. Awesome. Uh, so finally, Troy, I uh, just want to ask real quickly, uh, when you, there have been times during this video when you mentioned about uh, getting out of equities. Do you just go into cash or is there some other, some people go into gold, silver, some people go into bonds. Uh, where do you park your money if uh, you think there's going to be a, a volatility spike in, in the S&Ps and other indexes? The best thing to do is to always focus on what you do best, <laughs> which kind of sounds like fun. But so I'm really good at trading stocks, hence I focus on stocks, right? Because if you go into markets that you don't know too much about, it's kind of hard to make money, right? So what we do is that if we, we generally don't short the market when we think that there's a decline, for example, from September to right now, because the market could just as easily go up 10% and then go down 10%, so you end up making no money on your short, right? And in a bull market, it's not a good idea to go short because you don't want to trade against the long-term trend. That's just really hard, right? But in a bear market, we would go short, and we would go short in a very specific time. You would not want to go short at the start of a bear market because, like we said, it's very choppy, right? Like, you make some money, and then it goes back, and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> lost some of my gains, right? You want to go short, especially if you're going to use a leverage ETF or any inverse ETF for that matter, because inverse ETFs have a lot more ETF decay, right? Yeah. It's just the mathematical nature of how that's calculated. So you want to go short the market when it drops like a stone, right? When it's going down in a straight line. And that area, when it drops in a straight line, is always when the economy is in a recession, 
right? Mm -hmm. Because stock market tends to peak before a recession starts, but when the recession starts, that tends to be the middle of the bear market and you get that straight down decline. For example, 2001 from March to September, right? Stock market dropped like a stone, one straight line, the economy was in a recession, right? Just like the recession began in mid-2008, and that's exactly when the stock market started to drop in one straight line. So when it drops in one straight line, you're, but when you buy an inverse ETF, you're not going to lose that much money from the decay, right? And it's just it's a very nice and easy profitable trade, whereas the first half year of a bear market, it's it kills both the longs and the shorts. It's very hard to trade. Gotcha. Wow. I learned a lot today. Uh, I'm not quite ready to calculate standard deviations of standard deviations just yet. So I'm going to go over to bullmarkets.co and I'm going to learn more about that. I'm going to bone up on my own mathematical abilities, uh, which are probably not as strong as those of Mr. Troy Bombardia from Fundamental Capital and bullmarkets.co. I want to thank you for coming on and uh, schooling me. Um, uh, on you know how to how to play these choppy volatile markets. I really appreciate it. And on the 200 day moving average, I'm never going to look at it in the same way again. Uh, so thank you so much, Troy. We're going to have you back here real soon. Thanks a lot for coming today. All right, thanks for having me on, David. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.